Hello, everyone, and welcome to Texapa Live. I'm Harold Mullen with Texapa, and it's great to be with you for another edition of Texapa Live. My goodness, it seems like a long time since I've been able to say those words. We've gotten so busy, and everybody is running around the state uh, doing all the good work for good quality asphalt pavement. So uh, it's great to be back with you. And joining me today behind the old uh, boards back there is Jim Warren working his magic. Jim, how you doing, buddy? Good, Harold. Um, we're uh, we're having fun. We're trying. <laughs> haven't done this in a while. I've got a couple little little oops we're fit we're working on, but we'll get her done. So glad to be here. Man, great, great, great. That glad that you're here, so we can uh, do this. And you know, today's focus of Tex Apple Live is going to be on heavy duty, heavy duty flexible pavements. Yeah. Uh, with us to uh, to talk about that is one of our favorite researchers and, and favorite partners in our industry is Charles Gerganis. Charles, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for the invitation. Great, great. Charles is with the, the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. And Charles, you know, I know everybody knows you, but just in case there's a couple of people out there who, who have not gotten a chance to meet you, tell us just a little bit about your, your history and your career. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, about almost 18 years of industry experience now, 10 of that was with TxDOT. I uh, left TxDOT as the Longview area engineer up there in the Tyler district. Uh, came back to TTI in, or came to TTI in 2014, actually as a full-time student working on a PhD. So um, I thought that was a good idea. I'm not really sure why, but I'm married to a good woman and she said it was okay. <laughs> So we, we did that and finished up the PhD thing and have kind of moved into this world of uh, transportation researcher, uh, teach a little bit on the side for the college, and um, that's kind of who I am. So your primary, your primary purpose is research, and, but you, do, you do, do a little bit of teaching. That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah the day okay. job is researcher, and then, okay. um, yeah, I guess I moonlight. Um, as a professor, which may be a derogatory term. A moonlighting sure, but... professor. That's something, isn't it? There <laughs> that's right. Go. Exactly. I, I, bet you, uh, I bet you've attended a few football games over there too this year, hadn't you? Uh, actually, I've only been to one football game, but it was the best football game. <laughs> I, my son and I were at the Alabama game. Oh, you made um, it to Alabama. Okay. I made it to the Alabama game and we went, somebody gave us the tickets and I thought, you know, we can go sit for, until halftime and when it's a blowout, we'll bail. And uh, <laughs> next thing you know, um, it wasn't, it, a, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a blowout, was it? <laughs> it? It was not me and 106,000 of my favorite people had a lot of fun that night. That's for sure. 106,000 people. That's a, that's, that's a lot the capacity. Of people. That's, a lot of that's people. the, that's how many people were there. You know, we got fined a hundred thousand dollars for storming the field. And I thought we should just put a bucket out front and everybody can drop a dollar in it when they leave. And then we'll ship it to the SEC offices and tell them we're not really all that worried about it. A hundred thousand dollar fine for storming the field. Boom. Yeah, that's that's pennies in, that's a price of in college football. Wow. Well, they certainly enjoyed the enjoyed the game. That's for sure. So, that's right. Hey, let's go ahead and get into this, uh, uh, boss man. And uh, uh, what do you want? Where do we want to go with this thing? Um, yeah, we uh, we were uh, you know we have see. a great success story. Seems like here in Texas, and Charles has been a big part of that. He has helped us on our heavy duty pavements to. Go back and look at the perpetual pavements we have been doing in the state of Texas over mm -hmm. many years that uh, spans back. And we just want to talk about the success stories of the past and success stories of the future and, and where we are. So, uh, Charles, if you can kind of bring us up to speed on, on some of that, that past work that you've seen we did on the heavy-duty pavements and perpetual pavements. Good deal. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Harold, for that kind of intro. So, yeah, a couple of years ago, we decided we would take a look at, at heavy duty flexible pavements in the state and success stories across the state with just our flexible pavements in general. But we knew that so much of that had to center around heavy duty pavements. Our infrastructure is getting a lot older. Um, we're looking at needing to add capacity to things like the interstates or, or building or reconstructing our interstates. And so we know we're looking at high easel roadways. And so in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. up between 2004 to 2008, TxDOT, um, started to take a look at building some what they called perpetual pavements at the time on roadways where there okay. were more, to, more than 30 million design easels over that 20 year period. Okay. Back in 04, um, back in 04, you said 04 to 08? I think we got started maybe 03, 04. 03, 04. Okay. Started. Okay. Okay. Um, 
we particularly look, or I've got, I think, one slide there if, if we want to take a look at it. Sure. It's one of the real success stories out of that. It's on a section of I-35 right there, that one right there in New Braunfels. This was the um, one of the perpetual pavements that opened to traffic in 2007. Okay. So you can see the traffic volume projections there. I mean, we're, we're way over 100,000. We've got 14% trucks. I think this Turns out to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 51 million easels. Yeah, every time I go um, through there, it just it just jammed up. Oh yeah, certainly, yeah. and uh, lots of traffic. And uh, part of the reason this is a huge success story, you can see in there in that pavement structure. One of the things they did is they laid an inch and a quarter of PFC on mm. the surface. Okay, um, which obviously gives our users a great experience out there. It sure does um, in the rain, absolutely. In the rain, and I think you know people just love the the overall service of it because it's, it's a quieter pavement. Yep. And so, you know, people in, in today's vehicles with the types of tires that are on vehicles, and smaller um, tires, smaller tires, yep. that's right. People, particularly in sedans and minivans and things mm -hmm. like that, um, you know, certain surfaces can generate a lot of road noise, but a PFC is, is very quiet. Um, so it's a great user experience for the traveling public. And this PFC is actually, it's just gone under contract, I believe, to mill that surface off and put the surface back, okay. which if, if you think about that, that's 14 years of life in the state of Texas out of a PFC. That's, 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 a, that's uh, a great lifetime out of PFC, 14 years. Oh, it's years. phenomenal. Yep. And it's, this whole payment structure is doing exactly what we want it to do. Okay. It's heavy duty. It has experienced no real structural distresses at all. Okay. Um, and we put a, a tough and durable surface on it that's lasted 14 years that has given um, really a superior experience to the user because it's, uh, like you mentioned, Jim, it's great in the rain. We all mm -hmm. know the benefits of PFC in the rain. But it's you, I mean, quiet the, pavement. The, quiet, the but, quiet aspect of it, too, is really, I think, really important. Yeah, yeah, but especially for the user, right? They, they don't really think much about um, a lot of things, but they know when they go over a loud pavement. Um, we were just talking. We were just, we were just talking about that the other day about the issue having a going over or, or a pavement that that had a certain surface on it. And then they changed the surface. Mm -hmm. About the the people that live in that area, uh, their their impact and and the types of things that that they see and hear. All of a sudden, it's like, wait, where did that come from? You know, I mean, I get up yep. in the morning, get out at night, and from where I live, I can hear I-35. And uh, but depending on you know, sometimes depending on which which way the wind's blowing, I can hear something a little bit different. But you can certainly hear it, or the train coming by, those kind of things. So if it would change the surface all of a sudden, I'd definitely be able to hear the difference. And I think the and we we've seen it go both ways. Yep, we've seen it go both ways. So good good yeah. deal. The other thing is that section of pavement, and, and we would expect this out of a pavement that is structurally is doing exactly what we would want out of mm -hmm. it, which is the ride quality out there is still is really nice. I mean, for a road that is a flexible pavement that is 17 years old, sure, um, the ride quality is still amazing out there, which is going to be great. They're going to be out there going to lay a new PFC on it, hopefully get another 14, 15 years out of a PFC. Yep. We'll be 30 years into this pavement. Um, and it's doing exactly what we want a perpetual pavement to do for us. Good deal. Good deal. So we've kind of talked about the history a little bit. Um, let's let's kind of move forward and talk about some more recent things that you're working on. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, US 59. Yeah, so that's what's been kind of nice about this whole project working with TechSap and some of your members is that we we started looking at this and then we we haven't dropped it. We've kind of continued to look at where are we going with heavy duty flexible pavements and what do we need to do. And so uh, we've worked with Madden Contracting and Longview Asphalt up in the East Texas area where we kind of um, I don't want to say lucked into a heavy duty flexible pavement, but gave us the opportunity to to look at one um, that is currently being built. So. Uh, the Atlanta district up there had a section of US 59 that had a lot of uh, asphalt on it. Okay. And by plan note, they wanted to take all of the existing asphalt down to the existing base material. Okay. In, in some spots, stabilize that base material. And then they wanted to bring the profile grade back up to where it started. So however much mix came off wow. was the same amount of mix that needed to go back on. Okay. And what, what that ended up resulting in was an 11 inch pavement structure and an 11 inch pavement structure uh, in some places over a cement treated base material, which is 
Um, certainly a heavy duty flexible pavement. Sure, 11 sure. inches is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, absolutely. No, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, back in the day, you, know, I think when I was a, a young engineer doing project inspection, I'd have you know contractors tell me, "Oh, you can bridge anything with enough hot mix." I'm not sure that's 100 percent true, but 11 inches of hot mix ought to do wonders for you. And actually, yeah, uh, we saw that. We went up and thumped on it with the FWD. Did quite a bit of lab testing as well. But yeah, we've got a slide of that here. Hang yeah, on exactly. There we go. This is quite. This is a telling slide right here because mm -hmm. we went up there, we dropped the FWD on it, and and all you've got on this slide is that very first sensor of the FWD. Which okay drops and what that shows us is kind of the overall strength of the pavement structure so i'm not trying to back calculate any modulus here or tell you about um the strength of the subgrade or anything what i'm trying to show you here is that the deflection in that first sensor were between two and three mils on the vast majority of that project and that is the deflection zone that we are used to seeing for crcps so, so very little deflection, what, very stiff. Very little deflection. Overall, extreme pavement strength for okay. this particular project. In that two to three mil area um, deflection. Okay. That, yeah. And and so what we're really saying there is, is that um, maybe it wasn't intentional, but what we did was, or what Madden Contracting and Longview Asphalt did up there was essentially build a flexible pavement, a heavy duty flexible pavement that seems to have the strength of a CRCP type pavement. So very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. which kind of me leads us into the definition of what we would think perpetual would be something that's out there for a long period of time. But, but I think the one thing that is, is worth kind of continuing and where we're headed with the work that we're doing for Texapa is if we can build pavements similar to the I-35 job, if we can build pavements that are strong enough to stand up to these loads, mm -hmm. We also have to find a way to make sure we're producing surfaces that are tough and durable enough right. that we don't end up having surface issues right. that cause us to go out there and do maintenance. Right. That's that makes the, sense. That's that whole swing of, of, you know, you go from cracking to rutting and back and, back and forth and trying to find that balance, which is, you know, kind of what we're doing right now is talking about balanced mix design and doing a lot of work uh, along those lines in order to get there. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole toughness and tenacity and using kind of some mechanistic theory into the asphalt side uh, is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting transition, if you will, uh, bringing that. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Jim. And I think, you know, you and I were discussing about some of the things that are best practices and I, maybe this is a good, a, as good a time as any to mention it, but sure. we, we can talk about the lab test we can do mm -hmm. and different things like that. But one of the things you mentioned that, that I thought was a great point earlier when we were visiting was just the focus on density in the field. So yeah. a construction topic and the higher we drive density up, the more air that comes out of our mixes. And where does a crack typically form? I mean, if we, if we think about, you know, the, fracture mechanics mm -hmm. and the energy that comes where a crack will begin, it most likely always happens at an air void. Okay. And so okay. if we spend that time focusing on that rolling pattern and getting that density there, right. Mash it um, together. you know, you would think you're going to have a longer lasting tough surface out there. Well, you know, that, the you know, all the research is indicating that the, the research from NCAT, now the stuff that's been around for, for years and years. And they talk about, you know, deep, you know, uh, decreasing your air voids by 1% increases the life 10% or, you know, those, those kind of rough numbers. Um, you know, Ryan Barbarak was at our annual meeting and, and then he threw out a challenge. He says, let's get, let's get better density in the field. And so I think this is all, all of the same thing. We're talking about that in this pilot class that we're working on right now is, Hey, if we want to eliminate or minimize aging, guess what? Close up the surface so the air and water can't get in it for all the dense graded mixes anyway. And guess what? We're going to get a better, longer lasting pavement. And to me, what I, that also indicates to me is, is when we get to the point of recycling it, guess what? We're going to have a less aged wrap <laughs> to, uh, to bring back into the system as well. So I think there's really a win, win, win to try to just let's focus on density a little bit more. So, yeah, I think that's do. exactly right. In our super paved mixes, it can go a long way. There yep. may be somebody that's sitting out there and saying, "Well, if air if air voids are where a crack occurs, then why in the world do our PFCs ever stay together?" Yeah. Which is a, a a legitimate question. 
And I think it gets into fracture mechanics and I think it gets into the propagation of cracks yeah. where a crack moves from one air void to the next. And as soon as it finds another air void, the, the energy dissipates and the crack goes away. Because so you've think, got a continuous air void system in there, right? You've got a continuous air void system. So if anybody's out there thinking why it why we don't see our PFCs crack, I think that's what's going on. I do think that honestly is above me. I think um, I, I took Dr. Litton's fracture mechanics class here at A&M and he started to talk about that kind of stuff and it made sense in my head. But if you're asking about that's, that's where I'm at. That's it. Exactly. It's over here. Yeah, exactly. I hear you. I hear you. Well, let's keep going on. Let's, uh, you talked about, you want to talk about some overlay test results as, as we kind of go through this and kind of get a little bit more into that. I think you've got another slide here. Let me see if I can yeah, pull, and I, because pull it, it that does tie back in. Yeah. No, no, thanks for that, Jim. It ties back it into, it ties back into building a tough and durable surface. Sure. And so, you know, we, we talked about the constructability of a tough and durable surface and focusing on the densities out there. But mm -hmm. I think as a particularly our producer members, there's there's a lot to there's a lot of work still to be done in terms of how do we push the envelope on build uh, on producing mixes that fall in that sweet spot. That right. you see right there. So right. these are overlay test results from some of that work we did on the SuperPave C mix mm -hmm. on the US 59 project. Um, and you can see that some of them are listed as unaged and some of them are listed as aged. Right. The aged stuff was really some really off the wall aging that we were just playing with here at TTI, spreading the mix really, really thin. Some severe, aging. Some the, severe aging, not the normal standard you know, type that we'd normally see. Exactly. The, the In fact, the normal standard that you see, those are the green and yellow dots that uh, for most purposes fall in that sweet spot. So okay. yeah, I think, but that being said, with the, with the, as an industry and as researchers and people like Dr. Fuji Joe here at TTI, right. we need to think about if, if that sweet spot you see on the, that one oh. spot was oh, yeah, where, where we want our production mixes, it, as we pursue aging, where does the sweet spot move, and right. and how do we get there? And how so, do we get it? What, how do we move it back and forth? Yeah, and what? What's, yeah, exactly. What are the how do we move? You know, are there are there additives? Are there ways to do things like um, use warm mix additives but produce it at hot mix temperatures? Right. And that way, it becomes a compaction aid for sure. you. Sure. Are, you know, are those things that we can do to create more surfaces that are tough and durable because i think a lot of times when we hear owner agents out there telling us we're not getting the life out of hot mix it might simply be they don't like the fact that they think it ages too quickly you know maybe it goes from black to gray faster than sure. they would like maybe they think they're seeing surface cracks or longitudinal cracks well i mean that's, you know that's obviously i mean you do the same thing in your house i mean also you paint your mm -hmm. house spend a lot of money in your house and all of a sudden it's not looking that white white or that gray gray or that you know yellow yellow yep. it's kind of got that faded look to it and you go well it's still good it's going to last a long time but it doesn't i mean i looks yeah. at you know perception is people's reality and That's right. and if and if it if they perceive that it's not what they think it is then it's not so yep. Uh, yep. I think that's, you know, the, the one thing that's that's been kind of really exciting for me over the last couple of years is as we've kind of go through this, I'm going to go back to the slide for a second, is this idea of having this chart. Instead of just having a number, we're actually having a chart and kind of a, this these different areas, these, you know, tough crack and tough crack susceptible and soft crack. Same thing, the same idea doing with the uh, with the balanced mix design where they're having the same kind of chart but now we're having rutting on one one axis and cracking on another axis and trying to find and and put those mixes in the place in the, in the right box you know then if they're not in the right box well let's see what we can do to move it from this from this box over here over to the other box where we want to get it so i think there's some really cool stuff happening along the lines here so um exciting exciting so let's let's keep going um i know we're, we we don't have all day i'd love to talk yeah. to you i love talking to you because it's dude, you just got so much energy and so many good ideas and but uh you know kind of we, we've talked kind of talked about uh you know the the cracking the density we've talked about the ability for some of these pavements to what we consider flexible pavements almost act as rigid pavements um and so we have to look at the sub base and the subgrades and that kind of stuff but but where are we along the lines of, you know, how close are we? 
you know, we talk a long time as well. You got, you know, the 13 or 14 inches of concrete and you're going to have oh, all this kind of way, way thick asphalt. Is that what we're actually seeing out there? No, we're not seeing that. I think that's that's what got built in the early 2000s. Designers and engineers took a very conservative approach. Okay. Uh, and we were also playing with some different mixed types where they were really trying to focus on some stone on stone contact um, at low AC contents. And I think we've realized yeah. that that was a bad idea that yeah. We need that asphalt content. We need to bind that um, together. And so we've moved away from that. Uh, and there's been a lot of thick pavements that have been built across the state. Um, the Odessa district has done a lot of work out there. Tom mm -hmm. Scully and my colleague here at TTI has been out there and taking a look at those. And what we know is that we can use um, a higher modulus mm -hmm. in the design process when we stack a lot of hot mix on top of each right. other. And so that's actually been codified in TxDOT's pavement design guide. Now the it ability, is. if you if you lay more than six inches of hot mix, you can up that design modulus to 850 ksi. Um, that's a good number. That's still a conservative number for our risk averse engineer friends out yeah, there. I, th that's I think still some of them are kind of going, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they they think maybe it's too much, but the deflection data has shown that that that's still a conservative number. You okay. know, in reality, it's probably up around a million. Oh, really? um, not at 850, um, oh, but thousand, hey, we, yeah, we, okay. we need to hedge our bets a little bit, sure. right? We need to be careful. Yeah, and you know, it's year round. I mean, we got to sure. account for you know summer and winter, that kind of stuff as well. So. Yeah, exactly. So, um, the, well, I guess to, to and really answer your question, maybe more pointedly, is we can be inch for inch in terms of a hot mix design okay. against CRCP. Okay. Wow, that's yeah. that's a big that's a big change. Yeah, no, that's it is. Change. I think we can yeah. thin those up. I do think though, you have to think about design holistically there, and you have to decide how you want to deliver it. Right. Yep. So you everything's going to have unbound materials underneath it. Even concrete pavements have unbound materials. Yeah, and I wanted it. to get to that. I want to go. What, what I think we got another slide. I think there. we got that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Let me pull that up here. Um, right there and there. Oops. There. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about base and sub grade, sub base and sub grades. Let's talk about that a little bit because you you did a little work for us and you came up with some very interesting uh, conclusions. Sure. So uh, these are two kind of typical concrete pavement sections um, that are used in the Houston and Dallas districts. And, okay. and you can see that, you know, the, the one on the uh, left there, the Houston district one, 14 inches of CRCP. I mean, this is one of the most robust pavement designs in the state of Texas. But sure. you can see even underneath this CRCP, they're binding their unbound materials. They're okay. putting cement in their base and they're lime treating their subgrades. Okay. Uh, and, and at one of the things that we did in the initial study that I did for TexAPA and then the follow on study was we looked at some of the success stories and what was leading to success. And oftentimes the success stories had sections where the 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 layers below the hot mix had higher in place strengths than what we thought they would have had in design. And we got that oh, from okay. some FWD data. OK. Okay. And then you go back and you start looking at that and you find out, well, it, it probably had to do with stabilizing those layers. Okay. And so when we get into heavy duty, flexible pavement designs, um, maybe a, a better practice. Sure. You can say a good practice is density controlled subgrade mm -hmm. type a grade one or grade two flex base, right. and then hot mix on top of it. That is a, a perfectly acceptable, good design. Okay. A better design might be, Hey, let's, Let's stabilize our subgrade okay. with lime or cement. Let's let's look at the PI, figure out which is the proper stabilizer. Okay. And then let's stabilize our base material um, before we go back with uh, whatever layer of hot mix on it. When you say that you're willing to do that and spend that money, then when you get into the design process, you can think about how those stabilizers increase that strength. That's going to thin up that hot mix layer for you. Obviously, it's going to make it economically more competitive and, and maybe even most viable when you when you compare all of your different pavement designs. That kind of makes sense, Jim. Yeah, you know the, the thing about you know we're going to spend we want a pavement. We're not going we're not building a pavement for three years or twenty years or thirty years. We're we're not going to necessarily take these out, you know. So it makes sense to me to go ahead. Let's invest in the foundation. And, and and if we have to fix something, we can fix something, but it's really expensive to go back and try to fix the foundation once it's in place. And so, you know, by, by, by maybe spending it, I was talking to the, the class I'm teaching right now is like, you know, dirt is not sexy. <laughs> subgrade and sub base materials are not sexy, you know, 
but they're really, really, really important. And we've got to, we've got to spend the time and money and effort to make sure that they're in the, with the right materials in the right thickness, compacted to the right levels, sloped to the proper area, you know, sloped to the proper perspective. So when we put the additional layers on top of it, everything's going to work. If we just slop in the subgrade or slop in the sub base and then throw pavement on top of it, we'll bridge it with the next layer. I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with no, that. No, that's actually a terrible philosophy as well because the strength of your hot mix, the, if, if we want to tell our clients that you should use an 850 KSI modulus mm -hmm. when you're designing your hot mix, Modulus is dependent on the strength of the substructure that's underneath it as well. Exactly. So if you, if you, you can't just hog in 10 inches of hot mix and go, oh, it has a modulus of 850. Right. You should design to that when what's underneath it is not any good. You, it, Dr. Smith here at A&M always used to say, if you want to roll your sleeping bag up tight, do you roll it on the floor or do you roll it on the mattress? <laughs> well, you pull it off and you roll it on the floor because you can really roll sure. it up. Right. Building, building a road. And you can build the, same build way. the strength. And, and, if, exactly and if you right. found that case to be true with doing FWD and some of these existing pavements, it it works. That's right. It works. Yeah. If you've got good substructure, yeah. it's great. And you can go out there and have, you can have a maintenance section out there putting in 18 inches of mix and they go back to the same spot and they just keep putting mix on top of it over and over again because what's underneath it is not any good. So we've, we've got to think about, that in the both the design and the construction of it so it's not just the design it's yeah. also the quality of how we build it amen to that amen yep. to that well hey uh i think that's yeah we, i think, I think we we've got one more I slide got one more guys, slide yeah, in there for the group, if, it shows the actual the there competitive yeah so there we go. this is a competitive flexible pavement design um, okay. what i think is a competitive flexible pavement design that can um, compete with the CRCP designs that okay. are on the other page. All right. 51 million easel design. Uh, you've got 12 inches of hot mix, essentially. Okay. Um, I show that two inch SMA on the surface because I think we want to focus on tough, durable surfaces. Sure, so, absolutely. You know, making sure we drive towards those, I think, is a good thing. And I, I also, when I designed it, um, assumed we bound the layers. Um, okay. Cement treated the base and and treat the subgrade either lime or cement, depending on what your what your soil conditions are. Gotcha, gotcha. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. So I get back to the original. You asked the original question in terms of what thickness we were looking at. I mean, that's a that's twelve inches of hot mix. Okay. Um, right there. So we're so we're, we're essentially we're right at a place right where we in can there. Inch for inch. Yep. And then uh, you know, talking to a number, of Dr. Dave Tim at uh, at Auburn. I've spent a lot of time with him over the years and talking to him, and he's he's of the same kind of philosophy. We should be about inch per inch. Um, but again, we got to have a strong foundation to build upon. So uh, sure. I think we can, we certainly can do that. Um, well, Charles, it's, it's been a pleasure uh, having you here today. Uh, let me see. Oh, no, get thanks back, for the invitation. Get back up here and uh, um, had a little bit of technical difficulty with Harold and I, I, you could, I, you know, it's, it's when you mess with the boss, it's not a good thing. So um, I'll probably, I know, well, hopefully we bailed him I out. I know I'll hear about it later, but uh <laughs> At least he hasn't thrown his shoe at me yet. So I think we're good, or his boot. Um, you know, really appreciate you being here. I mean, there is so much good stuff happening in the area of just this technology of design, of materials, and, 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 and making sure we can, and even in the construction side, we're learning more and more stuff and, and being challenged uh, to build these things a little tighter, a little smoother. I mean, we didn't even, I mean, we talked a little bit about smoothness, but you know, if it starts smooth, it's going to stay smooth mm -hmm. and it's going to last longer if it's smooth. So all these attributes uh, are out there and it just, I mean, just goes to show to me is, hey, asphalt's no, no second fiddle to anything. I think we're actually number one and we've got better options and better capabilities than, uh, well, that other pavement that we have to deal with. So, um, but uh, any closing thoughts? No, oh, I just, I, I agree. I think we, we have to remember that we do have a customer and it is Absolutely. the traveling public at yep. the end of the day. We have a client that we build a project for, but we have a customer and those are the users of the system and flexible pavements can provide a superior user experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, very good. Uh, just wanted to throw a little promo out here. Wanted to let everybody know that we've got, uh, we've come up with a uh, inspector series. Uh, we have started uh, we'll be starting in November teaching classes again. And uh, those are the dates on the screen there. 
and uh, registration is open for November and December, and we will be opening uh, February up here very shortly, and uh, we'll be opening up about every month. We'll open up another one. We're trying to make sure we can kind of fill up these classes, but we started these last year, and or this this past year in January and February, ran five classes and got got good response. So we're back at it. I'm already getting phone calls and emails about it, and we've got people registered uh, for these programs. So I'd like to throw that out there to everybody. We're also uh, in the midst of piloting what we're calling an, an engineer asphalt essentials program, which is a first part of a series of programs that we're aiming towards uh, engineers. And so we're in the, we finished the first week uh, of the pilot and we're doing six sessions, just like we're doing with the inspector course. And we've got uh, folks from all around the districts, including materials and design or materials, design and construction, and uh, we're in the midst of going through that, and we're having a, we're having a good time with that so far. So uh, we hope to roll that out in January. So uh, we don't have it up for registration yet. We're trying to make sure we get through the pilot. And but as soon as we do that, we will get that information out. So we'd love to have you guys uh, join us. And uh, the Tech Zappa Executive Committee have decided uh, for the first year that program is going to be free. So uh, it's a it is a great opportunity to get to. Uh, Get some more information, some broad-based information about asphalt, particularly how it associates with the interrelationship between materials, design, construction, and maintenance, just like Charles was talking about uh, in this program and, and the interrelationship uh, back between them. So uh, we're looking forward to that uh, in the process as well. So thank you for attending today. Thank you for uh, coming back uh, to uh, join us on TechSAP Alive. We're uh, so glad you could join us today. Uh, we will be uh, starting to uh, get these programs back out on the air. I think we're talking about the third Thursday of the month, and we have we were working yesterday on some uh, programs for uh, the rest of this year and into next year. We'll be getting those scheduled out to you uh, very, very shortly. So uh, we're back and uh, we're back at it um, after a lot of demand. Uh, we've had a lot of people ask us, uh, hey, where is it? You know, we really love it. Do some more. So we're, we're back at it. And thank you for uh, the feedback on it. So in the meantime, be safe out there. Uh, it's Jim Warren. Uh, take care, everybody. God bless. And we'll see you on the asphalt.